do genres evolve? Should we say that they do? A talk by Carolyn R. Miller. Sponsored by the Culbertson Endowment, Indiana University, Department of English. Well, this, this is work that I've, uh, I've been sort of fooling around with for a while, um, uh, trying to understand the whole process of genre change and evolution in general. And I sort of got hung up on this idea of whether genres evolve, because we do keep saying that they do. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's let's take it take it away here. Um, I'm going to begin with a little prologue <coughs> about Heraclitus, who supposedly said that everything is in flux, that you can't step into the same river twice. <coughs> Known to us now only from secondhand sources and anecdotes. Heraclitus reportedly suffered from melancholia and died of dropsy in an unsuccessful attempt at self-treatment in a dung heap. He, <laughs> or so they tell us. <laughs> he was called obscure by his contemporaries and the weeping philosopher by the Romans. And he might well have wept had he foreseen the ridicule to which his thought about change was subjected by his successors. Plato and Aristotle accused him of denying the law of non-contradiction, claiming the identity of opposites, and positing that everything that is the same is actually different. Even today, philosophers disagree on how to interpret his cryptic statement about the river. Did he mean that it both is and is not the same river? Or did he mean, as some have suggested, that rivers can stay the same over time even though, or indeed because, the waters change. That is, the stability of larger structures is made possible by the fact that constituent elements within them change. Similarly, granting the difficulties of reconstructing Heraclitian thought, but also granting some subtlety to the opposition of sameness and difference, others suggest that the unity of the river as a whole is dependent upon the regularity of the flux of its constituent waters. Um, a complex whole might remain the same while its constituent parts are forever changing. <clears throat> it has become less difficult for us now to accept the notion that everything is indeed in constant flux at both the microscopic and cosmic levels. We know about the expanding universe, the undulations of light waves, Brownian motion, electron spin, sliding tectonic plates, the erosion of canyons and uplifting of mountains, the origin and extinction of species. But my premise is that in the 21st century, we still struggle to understand sameness and difference, stability and change, tradition and innovation in the world of human experience. Genre studies are part of this struggle. <clears throat> So I want to begin by looking uh, briefly at the way that evolution has been used in genre studies. This is going to be very, very cursory. There seems to be no question that we're in a period of dramatic genre change. New forms and capabilities develop every day with incessant claims in web news and blogs that this or that is a new genre demand demanding our attention. <clears throat> Anyone who searches Google or LexisNexis will find numerous such claims in mainstream media, promotional material, and user-generated internet content. And I've got just a couple of examples here. Uh, Wikipedia has an elaborate cataloging and taxonomy of video game genres. Um, I get a Google alert uh, every morning with uh, a cataloging of all the, the times in the previous 24 hours that the expression new genre has been used. Um, and I did some searching in LexisNexis uh, on the phrase new genre, and it's got an interesting uh, trajectory there. So we see such uh, genres as aristocrunk, steampunk, torture porn, hall videos, lol cats, fanfic, kitty noir, chill wave, mockumentary, and dirtbag sitcom. <laughs> it, it's dizzying. We seem to need genres to help us make sense of this blooming, buzzing confusion. Genres to help us help locate ourselves in what Virginia Heffernan called the mayhem and trivia of the mediated sociocultural world. In trying to understand the process of genre change and the emergence of what seem to be new genres in both new and old media, 
we have come to rely heavily on the concept of evolution. This is a term that is usually associated with biological change in diversity, so we might ask whether it's appropriate to use it in talking about social and discursive change. What work does it do, and what work does it keep us from doing? When we adopt the language of evolution, what do we import to our conceptualization of genres, of large-scale rhetorical action, and of the rhetorical organization of culture? So I've collected some examples of the way in which uh, the language of evolution pervades recent genre scholarship. I'm not going to read through these. I'm just sort of illustrating for you that it's there <coughs> in rhetorical studies, uh, in linguistics, in literary studies, um, in media studies, film and TV, and in information sciences and new media studies. In fact, we don't seem to have any other language for describing how genres <coughs> change over time. The language of evolution, including related biological <coughs> metaphors such as chromosome, ancestry, and genealogy, invokes an analogy between cultural change and organic or biological change over time. <coughs> what this analogy provides genre studies is a model that includes both diachronic change um, and synchronic variation. With diachronic change, we take note of relatedness, that is, an explanation of continuity through inheritance or influence over time. With synchronic variation, we take note of alternate forms and family resemblances of co or coexisting similarity and difference in varying degrees. Both dimensions contribute to the explanation of adaptation or fitness, the apparent result of a competitive process by which variations are selected and preserved over time, producing incremental change. Fitness, interestingly, uh, is a term of art in both evolutionary and rhetorical theory. Darwin came to use Herbert Spencer's phrase, survival of the fittest, as a synonym for natural selection. And rhetoricians have adopted Lloyd Bitzer's expression, fitting response, as a discourse that is adapted to its situation. We also have the related concept of decorum. Um, Catherine Schreier's description of genres as collections of variable features that are stabilized, excuse me, stabilized enough or stabilized for now <coughs> captures this process well and could as well be applied to organic species as to discursive genres. In fact, if we look into the history of these ideas, we can see evolution not as a mere metaphor or handy analogy for the process of genre change, but as a set of ideas that has been as central to thinking about cultural change as to biological change. <coughs> what is of particular interest is that the attempts to understand change and variation in the biological world and in the human world arose at about the same time and informed each other. At least this was news to me. <coughs> Scholarship on the history of evolutionary thought is voluminous, and I can't possibly treat it in adequate detail here. So in order to summarize a very long and complex story, I'm going to focus on a series of diagrams to suggest the issues involved in the development of evolutionary thought. I'll begin with a sketch of the sources of Darwin's insights into the origin of species, and then move to an equally sketchy account of the inquiry into linguistic and literary change. I'll then consider two specific issues where genre theory might learn from the discussions in biology. These issues concern taxonomy and teleology. So to begin with evolutionary thought in the biological sciences. <coughs> Versions of evolution predate Darwin by nearly a century, arising during the transition of the Enlightenment into Romanticism, informing inquiry into both the natural world and the history of language, with these two threads intertwined from the beginning. In examining the sources of Darwin's insights into the origin of species, alongside the inquiry into linguistic and literary diversity, what we see in both cases is a very long and difficult process that involved a fundamental transformation of thinking from essentialism to what the great 20th century evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer called population thinking. I believe these two kinds of thinking are both alive in genre studies today. 
<clears throat> Essentialism is re represented well by Plato's theory of forms, the fixed, unchanging, and distinct a day or essences that exist independent of the phenomenal world, which is merely their imperfect manifestation. From the perspective of the a day, variations are uninteresting, merely signs of the imperfection of the empirical world. According to Mayer, Essentialism dominated the thinking of the Western world to an extent that is now difficult to comprehend. Population thinking, in contrast, which Mayer calls a peculiarly biological concept alien to the thinking of the physical scientist, takes the unique individual as the starting point for analysis, not the type, valuing diversity and variation rather than stable abstractions. <coughs> it is more empirical and inductive, less mathematical and abstract. By introducing population thinking, says Mayer, Darwin produced one of the most fundamental revolutions in biological thinking. Evolutionary thinking in biology, then, is rooted in enlightenment efforts to understand the natural world. Natural philosophers like Linnaeus, Buffon, La Maitrie, Lamarck, Diderot, these are mostly French, Cuvier, and others, including Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus, struggled to understand the grand, harmonious plan assumed to be ordering the universe. Linnaeus's decades-long uh, labor to create a taxonomy of the natural world is one of the most important and earliest of these efforts. Linnaeus aimed to represent the rational plan of divine creation within his classification system, an ambition revealed by the title of his first work, Systema Naturae. <clears throat> he began with 18th century assumptions that species were invariant, that the relationships among them would reflect a single orderly system, and that this system would be a linear hierarchy, commonly uh, represented as a tower or ladder, the scala naturae, or a great chain of being with nature arranged in order of perfection or complexity, connecting the divine, there's God at the top, um, with the inanimate uh, at the bottom, you know, ranging through the, the, um, the angelic and then the human to the plant and animal and inanimate levels of existence. <clears throat> As he worked, however, Linnaeus came to realize that the burgeoning natural world could not be represented well by a single linear system that species were not immutable and that similar species might be related to each other. According to a 1957 study by the then president of the Swedish Linnaean Society, um, it is quite incontestable that Linnaeus in the 1750s had once for all given up his thesis of the absolute fixity of species. The most impressive evidence is that he removed the statement um, nullae species novae from the preface of the 12th edition of his Systema Naturae, <laughs> and crossed out the words natura non facet saltus in his own copy of the Philosophia Botanica from 1751. Meanwhile, in France, <clears throat> during the critical years 1744 to 1755, the philosoph created a new, completely materialistic worldview that included the first modern evolutionary theories uh, that were also anti-teleological. The multi-volume uh, natural history uh, published by Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, initiated what became the collective project of comparative anatomy. Significantly, his fourth volume from 1753 included sections on the horse and the ass that used anatomical homologies to speculate on the relatedness not only of these two domestic animals, but of all vertebrates. Somewhat later, Georges Cuvier followed his own earlier work on comparative anatomy with a 1796 publication on fossil elephants, the New World Mastodon and the Siberian Mammoth, comparing them to the living African and Indian elephants and claiming them as four distinct species with the fossil species apparently extinct. His subsequent 1812 four-volume work on fossil studies is now regarded as the founding document of vertebrate paleontology. <coughs> in John Rice's summary, the problem that the natural world presented to Cuvier at the end of the 18th century 
was the problem of the diversity of biological form in its broadest aspect. This problem was not just how best to classify forms, that is, how to find the most natural system of classification, whatever that might mean, but also how to interpret the system achieved. These problems, finding a basis for classification and understanding what it means, should sound familiar to genre theorists. The evidence that piled up inductively in the great collections um, uh, of the naturalists, Linnaeus's and Uppsala, and the royal collections in Paris, with uh, which Buffon and Cuvier both worked, weakened belief in linear hierarchical systems like the Scala Naturae and convictions about the fixity of species. It became possible to conceive of nature as a creative power and creation as an open-ended process. In a world where the evidence for organic change had become undeniable, Darwin's explanatory project, according to David Dennett, Daniel Dennett, uh, was twofold, to demonstrate that modern species had descended from earlier ones and to show how this could be so, that is, to find a mechanism for descent with modification. His solution, combining both diachronic and synchronic dimensions, involved random variation of features within a breeding population, continuity or inheritability of variations, overproduction of offspring, and natural selection produced by competition for survival. In the long process of developing his explanation, Darwin occasionally represented the diachronic and synchronic dimensions of the problem together as a tree diagram. His first such representation appears in a notebook in 1837, where he's clearly thinking through lines of descent with variation. Uh, Bowler tells us that Darwin came early to the view that evolution is a branching process, exemplified in the conditions of geographic isolation he observed in the Galapagos Islands. Um, so I put in this map of the Galapagos, and then when I, after I did that, I realized that there's a kind of similarity <laughs> between that map <laughs> and that diagram. Uh, I don't know if Darwin actually saw that, but uh, it's apparent to me. The origin itself included uh, just one diagram, that of a, uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but it's a branching diagram there, uh, that of a generalized tree to hypothesize descent with modification and differential survival. As he came to understand the role of competition and the likelihood of extinction, Darwin came to accept that a materialist rather than theological explanation was needed, that the designs of a creator were neither necessary nor relevant to the process of organic change. So natural theology is replaced by a natural mechanics, the notion of the species as a fixed type is replaced by a population of variants, and the linear hierarchy of the great chain of being is replaced by the figure of the branching tree. And I have here just uh, a couple of other tree diagrams. You know, once you get started looking for this stuff on the internet, it's just amazing what you can find. Uh, here are two from Ernst Haeckel in the years uh, shortly after Darwin when this form of representation became uh, uh, much more um, accepted, much more common. Um, <coughs> and, um, and then the other thing I wanted to do here was just to compare, to, to demonstrate the, the, the way that the axes work on these, on these tree diagrams. So we get the diachronic change in the vertical dimension and synchronic variation uh, on the x-axis there. <coughs> Uh, with the Scala Naturae, to compare that then, the uh, y-axis is different. That's de uh, degree of perfection rather than, there's no chronology implied there, so, but the, the x-axis is, is the same. <coughs> so to move then to evolutionary thought in the human sciences uh, in about the same time period, Darwin's project became thinkable not only as a result of enlightenment, rational empiricism, and mechanistic materialism, but also because of the intellectual countercurrent of European Romanticism. <coughs> Romanticism challenged the power of stable classifications and hierarchical relations to account for the world, uh, in offering instead developmental views of history. <coughs> in addition, an analogy between the human world and the organic world was made explicit in much romantic thought well before Darwin, taking form particularly in discussions of the history of language <coughs> 
and the history of literature. <coughs> in the 18th century, linguists had studied language in order to understand the mechanism of the mind. But according to Jonathan Culler, in the 19th century, they turned to the study of linguistic forms whose resemblances and historical links with other forms was to be demonstrated. So historical linguistics was born, assisted in part by religious interest in discovering the lingua adamica, the original tongue. Europeans exploring what is now India had noticed similarities between Sanskrit and the ancient European languages, Greek and Latin. Uh, such observations led to proposals in the latter half of the 18th century that these ancient languages had had a common source and that the Germanic and Celtic languages might also be related in a larger Indo-European family. The developments in comparative anatomy inspired some of this work. As Friedrich Schlegel, the German poet and literary critic, said in 1808, the decisive factor which will clear up everything is comparative grammar, which will give us altogether new insights into the genealogy of languages in a manner similar to that in which comparative anatomy has shed light on higher natural history. Darwin himself, in the first edition of The Origin, made a brief but explicit connection between biological change and language change by proposing that the pedigree of mankind could illuminate the classification and relationships of languages, both living and extinct. A central figure in the development of historical linguistics was August Schleicher. Schleicher developed a scientific view of language, arguing as early as 1848 that language has to be regarded as a natural organism because languages can be classified into genera, species, and subspecies, terms that he borrowed from the Linnaean classifications of a century earlier. Perhaps his most lasting contribution was Stumbaum theory, or family tree theory, which introduced tree diagrams to show groups of related languages. In 1853, he published the first such diagram, and by 1860, before he had read Darwin, he was using them frequently. Uh, here's a second one that he published in 1861 where it's just turned on its side. Um, there is speculation that Schleicher developed his approach to language not directly from biological scientists, but rather from his education as a classical philologist trained to create manuscript stemata. And there's just uh, an example of uh, what these, look, these diagrams look like according to the doctrine of shared errors, trying to find uh, what the original manuscript might have looked like. His teacher, Friedrich Richel, worked also on human genealogy, so the family tree may be the most direct model for this form of representation that proved useful in both biological and humanistic inquiry. And I have just again a couple of examples of family trees um, partly just to demonstrate how old this form of representation is. Here's the, the Jesse tree, the family tree of Jesus from the 15th century. Uh, here's a, a genealogical tree of the House of Habsburg from um, the 17th century. And um, there's a family tree that you might be a little more familiar <laughs> with. Um, I had to add in little Prince George Aww. down there. Um, <laughs> Linguistics was not the only human science in which an evolutionary model took hold. In literature as well, the evidence of diversity and change became difficult to ignore. The novel, after all, just didn't fit into the essentialist triad of epic, drama, and lyric attributed to Aristotle and Horace and enshrined in literary neoclassicism. Neoclassical poetics operating under the same 18th century assumptions that Linnaeus struggled with, that is, the invariance of species and the orderly hierarchy of their relationships, is known for its prescriptive rules invoked, says uh, David Duff, to both modernize and scientize the literary enterprise. Um, and I just, again, have some examples uh, uh, from, um, that, that I haven't really written about, um, of some of these um, neoclassical strictures uh, from John Dennis about the necessity of observing rules, uh, title page um, from a work in which the reader is taught the necessary rules of poetry by persons of the highest dignity, breeding, and fine sense. In Dubrow's summary, what engages neoclassical uh, critics above all 
is repeating and refining the rules for each genre and testing particular works against these norms. They also return frequently to the problem of the hierarchy of genres, sometimes accepting and sometimes challenging Aristotle's pronouncement about the supremacy of tragedy. As the rules were drawn from a rather narrow selection of poetic productions, uh, primarily the uh, works of classical antiquity uh, that were assumed to be timelessly immutable, they provoked heated discussion about the value of such works as uh, medieval romances, Renaissance tragicomedies, and the novel, which did not fit into these categories. A statement by uh, John Bailey illustrates the dual emphasis on essentialism and rules. The genuine work, of therefore, of criticism is to define the limits of each kind of writing and to prescribe their pro proper distinctions. Without this, there can be no legitimate performance, which is the just conformity to the laws or rules of that manner of writing in which the piece is, piece is designed. But the manner must be defined before the rules can be established. There's the essentialism. And we must know, for example, what history is before we can know how it differs from novel and romance, and before we can judge how it ought to be conducted. Uh, however, by the middle of the 18th century, according to Rene Wellick, uh, biological and sociological speculation stimulated analogous thinking about literature. Uh, and attention to the historical and contingent nature of the cultural categories that we call genres helped launch the movement that became literary romanticism and became characteristic of it. Duff calls attention to a number of developments that illustrate the newly fluid role that genre played, noting, for example, that in multiple collections of poetry, the use of generic terms with adjectival qualities such as elegiac sonnet, pathetic ballad, sentimental pastoral increased market, markedly in the late 18th century. And in the romantic movement, genre mixing became an overt critical ideal, with Schlegel declaring that the romantic imperative demands the mixing of all genres. The very title of Wordsworth, um, Wordsworth's uh, Revolutionary Lyrical Ballads is a case in point, mixing the classical lyric with the popular ballad. Duff also points to the interest in marginalized genres and folk or primitive literature as evidence of this new turn in genre theory. Romanticists associated with the primitivist movement, presuming an authenticity in early civilizations, used a stematic method similar to that of the historical linguist to trace related forms back to an ur er genre. Duff calls romanticism's abandonment of aesthetic fixity uh, a remarkable episode in the history of ideas, pointing out that an effort of imagination is required to recall a time when it was believed that genres were static, universal categories whose character did not alter across time. In an interesting parallel, Dennett notes that we post-Darwinians are so used to thinking in historical terms about the development of life forms that it takes a special effort to remind ourselves that in Darwin's day, species of organisms were deemed to be as timeless as the perfect triangles and circles of Euclidean geometry. After Darwin, as evolutionary thinking percolated through the later 19th century, uh, it continued to influence the study of language and literature until the early decades of the 20th century, when Saussure persuaded linguists to set aside diachronic concerns as they were already abandoning biological metaphors and treat language as a synchronic system, uh, ushering in a period when language and literary studies both took such a distinct lack of interest in evolution that by 1956, Rene Wellick could claim that 50 or 60 years ago, that would be at the very early part of the century, the concept of evolution dominated literary history. Today, it seems to have disappeared almost completely. As interest in evolutionary thinking declined, so also did interest in genre, in part because of the continuing romanticist opposition to convention and commitment to radical creativity. And in both literature and linguistics, genre study fell out of favor through much of the 20th century. It has returned, of course, and recently Franco Moretti has given some attention to the role that tree diagrams can play in understanding trends in literary uh, history. I want to I, I spend some time thinking about that a little more than I've been able to. Uh, 
And I think there's an interesting and complex story to be told about the sort of recovery of genre studies, but I don't know that story yet, and we don't have time for it if I did. So now I would like to turn from this historical sketch to consider two specific areas <coughs> in which genre theorists might learn from the extensive and concerted efforts by biological scientists to conceptualize evolution. I'll focus here on two central issues, um, to, uh, and two issues central to the evolution, I'm sorry, boy, to the, um, this, this, is, this needs some revising, <laughs> uh, central to the development of evolutionary theory, taxonomy, and teleology. Let's just start with taxonomy. The problem of taxonomy is represented by the tree diagrams we've been looking at. What kinds of relationships are being mapped? What is the unit of analysis? Under essentialism, the unit was the fixed species and affinities and similarities, the relationships. The whole taxonomy aimed to represent the plan of creation of the designer of the world. Such taxonomies assisted in naming and identification and thus in appreciating the complexity and beauty of creation. Essentialism precluded the notion that species themselves could change or transmute. Classification of these fixed entities was achieved by what uh, Mayer calls downward division uh, based on Aristotelian logic with the assumption that this natural structure would reflect the order and logic in the, in the created world. Thus, one begins with um, easily recognizable and widely, widely accepted categories such as trees, shrubs, and herbs, or animals of one sort or another, and divides each of these into subordinate classes of plants or animals uh, based on differentiae that allegedly represent the true essences of these organisms. The problem is that there was little disagreement about these differentiae, about which similarities and differences are essential. For example, in the animal kingdom, it made a great deal of difference whether one chose as the first differentia, whether the animal had blood or not, whether it was hairy or hairless, or whether it was two-footed or four-footed. And as for plants, according to Mayer, no two botanists of the 17th century arrived at the same classification. So that's your design of the natural world. The slowly developing taxonomic chaos contributed to the weakening of essentialism and led to a slow and almost imperceptible transformation of taxonomic theory uh, after the publication of the 19th uh, edition of Linnaeus's Systema Naturae in 1758. I'm not sure what was so magical about the 19th edition. I have to go back and look that up. The alternative approach that developed uh, upward or uh, compositional classification was inductive and empirical and was driven by the interest in diversity that Linnaeus's work had stimulated and the continual discovery and description of new species. It became clear that the scala naturae and the assumptions of a fixed and manageable number of species would never be adequate to the complexity and multiplicity of the natural world. Upward classification begins, down there at the bottom, uh, with the observation and cataloging of variation and diversity and the grouping of organisms by multiple features rather than one to constitute the groups. This is what Mayer calls population thinking. In upward classification, as Mayer emphasizes, what is being classified are not species, but individuals, specimens. The species is not the starting assumption, but rather the hypothesis that needs to be discovered or demonstrated. The essentialist approach to species presumed that all members of a species share the same essence, that each species is distinct from all others, that each is constant over time, and that the variations of members from the essence is limited. The population thinker recognizes both variation and continuities across individuals, and the species concept becomes notoriously difficult to pin down. Dennett notes that Darwin declined to provide a definition of species, holding that it was more prudent to consider it a term of convenience rather than one of principle and adds that more than a century after Darwin, there are still serious debates among biologists about how to define species. All of this sounds to me a lot like our discussions about how to define and recognize a genre. We have our essentialists and our population thinkers. Among the essentialists, we might number Aristotle, Northrop Frye, 
and certain linguists and literary scholars. These theorists base their definitions on a posited essence, a theory of communication that maps formal possibilities or fundamental capabilities of language. Among the population thinkers, we could include ethnographers and applied linguists like uh, Sh Catherine Schreier and John Swales, who gather specimens and examine them for similarities of social or linguistic features, developing categories more inductively. These researchers help us to catalog the amazing diversity of human communicative activity and the ways it interacts with social and technological change. But there's another kind of thinking that I think can also shed light on genres, a line of reasoning that is neither fully essentialist nor population-based, but is perhaps something of both. And to understand this third kind of thinking, we have to go back to that troublesome concept at the heart of the matter, the type, the species, the genre. For corpus linguists or population biologists, the type represents the collection of specimens on the shelf, in the drawer, distributed across the environment. It's an, a description of an empirical multiplicity. For the essentialists, whether biological or discursive, the type represents a fundamental capability or possibility. But what we have learned from phenomenological sociology and cognitive psychology is that types can also be thought of as social agreements, shared recognitions about what is worth noticing in the world, what recurs and what signifies. The type represents what we agree has happened and what we expect may happen. This is what we might call a nominalist approach to the problem, which makes the type neither a collection nor an essence, but literally a name, or rather what is invoked by the fact of our naming something, a shared concept. I have elsewhere suggested that genres may be found when we, where we have names for types of discourse, that is, for shared expectations about what constellations of discourse features will achieve which social actions. Uh, the de facto genres, the types we have names for in everyday language, tell us something theoretically important about discourse, I once claimed. This hunch, I think, is borne out by Rosh's work in cognitive psychology on categorization and concept prototypes, which shows that categories are generally designated by names. That is, we name groups of objects in our world that we consider to be equivalent in some useful way according to the principles of cognitive economy and social perception. Moreover, categorization involves both vertical and horizontal dimensions. On the vertical dimension, um, uh, let me see, I'm not sure I've got these slides lined up right here, but <laughs> let me see if this works out. On the vertical dimension, the most common and useful names, no, I, you know, I, I, you know, I need to skip through these. There we go. This is where I, where I wanted to talk. On the vertical dimension, the most common and useful names indicate what Rosh calls basic categories which indicate the most inclusive or abstract level that also recognizes what she calls natural discontinuities in perception. Thus, category names tell us what phenomena are understood as useful and important. The psych psychological research focuses on objects in the world, such as dogs and cats, chairs and tables, but it seems reasonable to suppose that the same principles could be at work with discursive objects, such as sonnets and news reports, blogs and video games. Members of superordinate categories <coughs> share fewer attributes and are thus less useful for ordinary purposes. Members of subordinate categ <coughs> categories uh, share more attributes and are thus more difficult to discriminate. Basic level categories then reflect the perceived structure of the world, much like Alfred Schutz's types and as a result may not be fully consistent or systematic as these perceptions change over time with new conditions and new cap capabilities. If perceived discontinuities are regularly stable, however, the categories may come to seem like natural kinds with essences. The vertical dimension then uses the scale of inclusiveness um, or abstraction. Um, while on the horizontal dimension, our categories divide the world into repeatable units, which we refer to when we use names like dog, table, news report, novel, blog, and tweet. Uh, 
According to Roche, these basic cuts in categorization are made at discontinuities that mirror the structure perceived in the world. Our categories identify repeatable units that are both perceptual and functional, and at the basic level, they are relatively easy for us both to discriminate from background variation and relatively important for us to interact and with and talk about. How do we identify these categories and learn the categories recognized by others in our social world? The tr traditional answer was that the essence of each category discriminates the dog from the cat, the chair from the table, that some criterial features can be used to distinguish these natural kinds. But just as evolutionary biologists have had difficulty identifying species, cognitive psychologists have demonstrated that most of our everyday categories are similarly difficult to square with an essentialist approach to naming categories. Like species, our categories do not have clear boundaries. They change over time and across location. They do not produce clear taxonomies based on consistent criteria. Conceptual categories, like biological species, are better understood through Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblances. So we're back to the royal family here, um, rather than through, lo a lo through essences or logical criteria. This means that specimens within a category do not necessarily share any common feature, uh, but that each shares at least one feature with other specimens. Within a family, some members will have similar noses, perhaps many will have similar skin and hair coloring, and some will have similar body types. Some may share many features with other members, and some may share only one feature with only a few others. And all, as a population, share fewer features with members of other families. A category, then, is a loose cluster with perhaps questionable issue, uh, instances on the margins and some instances that seem fairly central or most representative of the concept. These central specimens um, are what Roche calls prototypes that are most easily identified. Uh, on the horizontal dimension, then, um, the, um, the category, uh, there we go, the category, that is the species or the genre, is always going to be a bit fuzzy, although the relevant test is of social utility. On the vertical dimension, there are two possible scales. Uh, one is the level of abstraction, which is characteristic of essentialist top-down category formation as practiced by Linnaeus and by virtually every biologist before Darwin. The other is diachronic, showing shared ancestry, uh, relationships of replication over time. Biological thought has completely rejected levels of abstraction um, of, uh, for the diachronic relationship of shared ancestry. Um, I think I probably have too many diagrams in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm confusing myself with them at this point. Um, because this is the scale that explains evolution. That's the scale that explains evolution in both dimensions, change over time and the existence of synchronic categories. Roche's work suggests that cognitive category formation takes both scales into account. Uh, and genre theory, that is socio-cultural evolution, needs to retain both because our shared recognitions are based both on agreements about what, levels of what level of discrimination is functional and on shared experience with ancestral genres. The implications for genre theory, um, well I just have here is a, um, a contemporary tree diagram uh, used in this very interesting website called the Tree of Life. Uh, and then here is a <coughs> an attempt to give a family tree of a uh, highly recognized genre, contemporary genre. Um, the implications for genre theory are that the categories of socio-discursive interaction that genres represent are indeed socio-cognitive entities. They are neither essentialist, objective, natural kinds, nor fully empirical materialist corpora. They are rather social concepts on what I would call a basic cognitive level that corresponds with the experiential history and functional needs of the community that posits them. They help us carve meaningful units out of the blur of artifacts and stimuli that surround us. And they're capable of changing over time because they are constituted not by any essential features, 
but by multiple possible features in varying combinations. If we want to understand why a combination of features occurs as it does, then the genealogy is helpful. But if we simply want to write a good blog or teach about blogging, then we need to attend to the range of variation of features that are recognizable, functional, and fitting. So finally, my last section on teleology. I think this is a bit shorter. Um, I, I think don't want to try your, your patience here. Darwin's notebooks show that as early as the 1830s, he, has, he had pretty much abandoned the widely accepted assumptions of natural theology that the adaptations of organisms to their environment are the result of design and that design requires a designer. And here is just the classic statement of the argument from design by William Paley in 1802. I won't go through that in detail. These assumptions about design have proven quite resilient, however, and we are still having Victorian-like discussions about creationism and intelligent design, even to judge only by the titles of several recent books written to refute it. Dawkins's The Blind Watchmaker, uh, Rice's Not by Design, and Dennett's own book. Darwin's dangerous idea uh, in Dennett's formulation is exactly this, that over, a, over time, a mindless algorithm can produce the effects of, de of design, that the various processes of natural selection, in spite of their underlying mindlessness, are powerful enough to have done all the design work that is manifest in the natural world, that the biosphere is the outcome of nothing but a cascade of algorithmic processes feeding on chance. However, the, the language that Darwin chooses to express his central idea, natural <laughs> selection, with its intimations of choice and agency, embeds constant reminders of a designer. Given the strength and pervasiveness of natural theology in Darwin's time, his well-documented rhetorical caginess about how to introduce his I ideas that he well knew were dangerous and his own occasional ambivalence, he has a very hard time not treating natural selection as an agent, as in this well-known passage, and I won't um, read it to you. It's probably fairly familiar. Um, Darwin himself ultimately apparently conceded that natural selection was a bad term. <clears throat> if evolution is a general model of historical explanation that applies to cultural change as well as to biological change, must we also relinquish teleology, let go of the fourth and final cause? Is cultural evolution also a mindless algorithm? Or since we think of ourselves as purposeful beings and we interpret others as seeking goals, do we need a teleological model of change different from that of the biologists? These questions highlight the relationship between genres and their users and environments of use. And although few might be tempted to posit a divine discourse designer, we do need to consider the issue of individual and systemic discursive agency. For the present, I would like to dramatize this issue by contrasting John Swales's focus on communicative purpose with my own focus on rhetorical exigence, as this is a difference of long standing and one that points up some interesting problems in characterizing the pragmatic dimensions of discourse. It won't answer all of those big questions I just asked. <coughs> in 1990, excuse me, <coughs> let me try this. In 1990, <coughs> that didn't work, Swales presented a working definition of genre <coughs> that offered <coughs> communicative purpose as a privileged criterion for identifying the members of a genre. At the time, and in subsequent work, he recognized some complications of this approach. <clears throat> for example, that purpose is not always legible from a communicative event, either by an analyst or by a participant, and that purpose may be multiple, conflicted, unrealized, layered, implicit, ineffable, insincere, and so on qualities that are not helpful in a privileged criterion. These recognitions have led him not to turn elsewhere for a central criterion, but rather to recommend how the analyst can approach the problem of identifying purpose more responsibly. 
<clears throat> it is sensible, he says, to abandon social purpose as an immediate or quick method for sorting discourses into generic categories while retaining it as a valuable long-term outcome of analysis. This central criterion, however, remains somewhat mis mysterious. It seems to be centered on the communicator, the user or perhaps animator of the genre, though it is necessarily social and cannot be the same as the private intentions of individuals. Swales also uses some alternative expressions, equating purpose at one point with function and elsewhere with use value. Nevertheless, inferring from our everyday understanding of purpose, we might say that purpose is the aspect of communication that drives toward a goal beyond the communication event itself, an end for which communication is the means, a state or situation, if achieved, that is outside of and beyond and usually subsequent to discourse. The goal pulls the speaker or writer and the text and the, the speaker or writer and the text and the audience toward itself, and purpose links us to the goal avant la lettre. It is anticipatory. My own focus has been not on purpose, but on exigence and the associated term motive. These may be just as mysterious as purpose, perhaps more so, but I think they're different in significant and useful ways. Bitzer defined exigence as an imperfection marked by urgency, a defect, an obstacle, et cetera. And while I think there are problems with his formulation, um, uh, it, it is useful here. Uh, exigence is not a goal toward which one aims, but a problem away from which one needs to move. It motivates action, pushing us from behind, so to speak. A motive is what moves us. The recurrent exigence uh, of a genre is not a matter of material forces, but of shared uh, social recognitions, or what I have called uh, an objectified social need. Um, and I'll get to that function business in a minute. Both purpose and exigence are ways of addressing the question why, but they provide different answers. Purpose poses the question from an actor's point of view. Why are you doing this? What is your aim or goal? It is teleological, implying a movement toward inviting assumptions about progress, uh, perfection, and hierarchy, uh, all of which have become suspect in evolutionary biology, certainly. In contrast, function poses the question from a system's point of view. Why does this happen? What does it achieve not only for any actors or agents involved, but also for the stability and viability of the rest of the system? It implies a movement away from invoking assumptions about instabilities and perturbations, but also about continuity and endurance. In purpose, we see the potential for change and innovation. In function, we see the forces of stabilization and adaptation. My contention, then, is that function is specifically useful for thinking, thinking about genres because it requires us to consider recurrence, repetition, and reproduction. Purpose turns our attention towards the individual, the singularity, the nonce event. I don't mean to suggest that genres don't allow for innovation, but rather that they require us to account for innovation within a context of imperfect replication and incomplete stabilization. And I think this is exactly what the evolutionary model uh, emphasizes. In biology, some innovations, most in fact, are non-functional and many are destructive. Non-functional innovations may be replicated, may acquire function and become favored, or may be rapidly eliminated because the organisms carrying them cannot reproduce. But they are always being judged by the system, by the interactions between the organism and its environment. So evolutionary thinking turns our attention not only to recurrence, but also to the ecological system, the environment in which both innovation and recurrence have meaning and are judged. If we adopt the minimal model of evolutionary change, uh, and this is Dennett's representation of it, um, uh, and posit the genres changed by the differential survival of variable replicating entities, then any genre acquires recognition as a genre in virtue of its having survived, that is, having been replicated sufficiently. Um, 
either uh, uh, literally replicated or replicated in minds of, of people. Uh, but what has survival value? That there are social recognitions and satisfactions in this form of social action. This again means that the genre is functional. But at the same time, survival through replication also means that the genre has changed, since replication is never duplication, and since even the fact of replication changes the significance of its force and patterns. I want to suggest then that thinking in terms of function can help us understand genre change. Go back to that. Uh, because of its focus on recurrence and the genre system as a whole, and that the general model of evolution can be productive in this regard. But we shouldn't push the analogy too far beyond the minimal model. Evolutionary biologists tell us that the only purposes that genes or organisms have is to replicate themselves. This is their teleology. In genre theory, we must be able to take into account the experiential fact that we are purposeful beings in quite other, or perhaps I should say additional ways, and that our understandings of genre change must be able to take into account the role of sing singularities, of the determined or inspired or disruptive individual, and of unprecedented and surprising situations. For these are the sources of variation, subject to selection pressures, that include not only cultural conventions, conditions, and values, but also the purposes of others. My point is that to make these specifically relevant to genre theory, we must look at them under the aspect of the recurrent and the systemic. The challenge for genre studies, in rhetorical genre studies particularly, is to attend in both directions appropriately, both towards purpose and towards function. We must study the variety of influences on historical change, and thus the multiple factors that an evolutionary theory must acknowledge. When do the uh, efforts and intentions of individual agents make a different difference? When do institutions, economic and market forces, systems and structures, the weight of tradition have effects? What kinds of influences does technology yield, wield? In conclusion, I don't want to be understood as suggesting that our understanding of cultural change must borrow from biology. Rather, I'm suggesting that evolution is a model of change that is more general than either biology or language and applies equally and somewhat differently to both. And I'm not advocating that we become taxonomists of genres or that we must draw family trees of the genres we teach or study or that we abandon the notion of purpose or intention in understanding our socio-discursive environment and our modes of interaction. I do want to suggest that we be conscious of the assumptions we make about essences and relationships, of how and why we identify something as a genre, that we be alert to the differences between classification by abstraction and classification by descent, that we distinguish between purpose and function and their implications for personal agency versus systemic and situational pressures. We have much to learn about the process of genre change and the emergence of new genres, and we need all the tools we can find. I hope that this look at evolutionary theory can be useful in that effort. Thank you.